All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Matt Hendrickson. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second in a series of our DO Digest. As I mentioned, this is the second in a webinar series for the, called the DO Digest. And the DO Digest is an ongoing webinar series that's being offered in conjunction with the White Cap Institute to provide real life clinical tips and tricks and actual feedback for using DO implants and the DO Navi guided surgery protocol. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, DO is an established implant manufacturer with a presence around the world as a best in class manufacturer of implant fixtures. In addition to that, DO is the world leader when it comes to a guided surgery and creating a process for you to easily manufacture uh, guided, to plan out your guided cases and provide you know, guided cases for your patients. The White Cap Institute, who's assisting with this webinar today, is a world leader uh, in the area of training people on placing implants. White Cap Institute is the creation of Dr. P.K. Clark, who created the Institute specifically out of a passion to provide real life, hands-on, rubber meets the road feedback on training people how to successfully place implants and really help people just maximize their success with implant placements. I personally have the opportunity and pleasure to work closely with both DO and with White Cap. And with that, I get, also get to introduce uh, Dr. Riley Clark uh, from the White Cap Institute, who's going to be the instructor today. Uh, Riley is a graduate from Case Western. He holds several different certificates, including um, a, he's an adjunct professor with the University of Utah uh, School of Dentistry. He's a master in uh, implant prosthetics, a board certified diplomate with the International Congress of Oral Implantologists. He is, of course, a diplomate of implant dentistry with the White Cap Academy of Implant Dentistry. Um, he's a general dentist who's been placing implants exclusively for almost the entire time of his practice, and just a phenomenal person that uh, really, again, has a real passion for helping people to really be successful. And he's one of the most experienced people literally in the world when it comes to guided surgery and planning uh, surgical cases. Um, uh, through computer simulations ahead of time and using surgical guides. And so, Riley, really appreciate you doing this uh, course for us today, and, and I'll turn the time over to you. Hey, thank you, Matt. Appreciate the introduction, and uh, grateful for all of you that have taken the time to join with us today. Um, I know you all have busy schedules and appreciate the, um, the effort to be here. I hope that this is helpful and meaningful, and we're going to jump right into it. I'm really excited about our topic today um, of digitally planned sinus augmentations. I think as we do lots of implants, we obviously come across those maxillary posterior teeth, um, some of the first to come out when you look at our patient populations, and that sinus is often in our way, and we need to navigate that sinus in a way that's predictable um, for you know, good outcomes so we can get our implants in there. And so this topic is extremely relevant. Uh, and I think it's something a lot of us deal with um, constantly. And I'm always excited when a procedure that is done often in our practice has a workflow now that can help it be more predictable, easier, um, just less stress for everyone involved, including the patient. And so really, really excited about the topic. This is a great one for us today. I'd like to jump in and spend about 10 minutes or so just talking about the sinus and how we evaluate it. Um, why does it pneumatize? some of the, the reasons why we have to go into this um, surgical procedure of a sinus augmentation. From there, I'd like to introduce um, a really clever clinical um, technique with the DO system, of how we can augment the sinus. And then I'll show you a couple of cases I've done recently. Actually. So appreciate you here. Um, again, let's jump right in. Let's talk about the etiology of the sinus pneumatization. Why does this even happen? Um, that's something that I've often wondered. And as I talk with patients, they wonder, why does this happen? And some of it has to do with just patient anatomy. Some sinuses are already low, falling down into the furcation of these trifurcated roots of posterior maxillary molars. Sometimes um, it's a combination of other factors, though. I think low bone density and the chronic air pressure as we breathe are some of the main reasons we see the sinus begin to pneumatize and come down. As we breathe, that membrane fills up with air, that positive pressure chronically pushes down on already a very weak architecture of bone, 
causing this pneumatization. It's not that the sinus floor comes up, it's that the sinus floor drops down into that alveolar process. And so we kind of have the perfect storm, a trifurcated root, so three big holes already in the bone. When that's extracted, low bone density, which is common in the posterior maxilla, and then this chronic air pressure um, pushing down on the bone. And that's why we deal with this constantly and routinely. And I always like to remind my patients, it's nothing unique to your anatomy. This is human anatomy. This is just the way it works. It's very rare that I see a first, second maxillary molar that does not need some type of vertical um, bone augmentation. And so this is just the nature of, of doing surgery in the posterior maxilla. And so I think that's important to understand the etiology, understanding the why is this something we have to deal with. Now, when it comes to the sinus, I always want to stress, I think it's um, probably bad practice just to jump right into the clinical procedure without talking about some of the peri procedure um, things that we need to evaluate, which is basically the CT. What is the health of the sinus best viewed from a CT, not a pano, not a PA, but a CT image, I think is the standard of care today um, before we go in and do surgery in the sinus. If you ever have problems um, reading a CT and want help doing that, I put my personal contact here. This is seethroughreports.com. That can be a great resource for you doctors if you're looking for someone to help you read or interpret your CTs. Um, a great doctor runs that system there, radiologist, and that can be really helpful. But we need to review the CT analysis, make sure that the CT itself shows a clean sinus. We also need to do a system reviews system review of the maxillary and paranasal um, disease potential. And so steroid use, antibiotic use, nas nasal obstructions, different sinus surgeries should all be evaluated before we go in and do a sinus procedure. Um, now, in the CT, here's the most important part of the lecture probably today. In the CT, if you're seeing something that looks less than ideal, you're seeing some type of pathology or disease, acute or chronic, it is really important that we determine that the ostium is patent. And the only way to do that is with the CT, sometimes a little higher field of view might be necessary. And so you need to work with your CT to make sure you can get superior enough to um, see that open ostium. That open ostium provides the ventilation that allows the sinus to clear itself from acute and chronic diseases. And if it is a chronic disease, most likely there is a patency issue with that. Um, I was asked by a doctor who's registered for this right now um, to maybe put a slide or two in explaining that anatomy. And so here you're seeing on the right, um, more of a cartoon type illustration showing the maxillary sinus, the ostium, and then how that connects with our airway system. And then on the left, you're seeing the actual visual on a CT. You can see that you need to be somewhat high to be able to interpret this ostium and its opening. So that's really, really important. Before we even talk about sinus surgery, a proper evaluation of the patient needs to be done. These are some of the criteria in a nutshell in a you know 30 second demonstration here that need to be um, outlined and understood. So that is um, my perioperative kind of workup is making sure that I'm determining that these things are healthy and well. The problem with an uh, ostium is not functional, then the sinus is more prone to infection. And then obviously if a sinus is more prone to infection, then our graft is more prone to becoming infected as well. And we don't want that with our outcomes. What we don't want to do is implore a great surgical technique, get a great surgical outcome at that very moment, and then let some type of chronic sinus issue and, you know, affect our our great work that we did clinically. And so some thoughtfulness preoperatively is gonna pay big dividends for us postoperatively. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. I had a request from a doctor to explain some of that. And I do think it's important that we, you know, respect the sinus medically um, before we go in and just surgically augment an area of the body without proper evaluation. So with that said, I wanna talk a little bit about sinus anatomy because I find sinus anatomy in terms of the floor of the sinus can greatly affect the outcome of our surgical procedure. Today, what we're mainly gonna be talking about is a digitally planned sinus procedure. Crestal approach, not lateral window, crestal approach, where we can go in minimally invasive and augment that sinus. However, the floor of the sinus and its anatomy is particularly important to the success of our workflow. So 
if you haven't looked at a lot of CTs, um, these views might be a little bit new to you. But here you're seeing the sinus both from a buccal lingual and a mesiodistal position. The buccal lingual anatomy there on your left is very, very common throughout almost every sinus. I mean, there are typically some variations, but nine out of 10 of them are gonna look like this. You're gonna have the same angle of that lateral wall. The medial wall comes in, dips in towards the nose and then goes back out laterally. That's a very typical um, anatomical representation of the sinus. Obviously it's very pneumatized in this position. The alveolus is very, very minimal, maybe two, three millimeters there. But that's typical, always bowl shaped from a buccal lingual perspective. Now, mesiodistal, that is where the sinus presents with some unique anatomy. And understanding that anatomy and what that anatomy will lend itself to in terms of surgical results, I think is really important. As I've done lots and lots of these cases, I have found that the shape that you're seeing here on the right is ironically the most ideal for a crestal sinus lift. I say ironically because that's a big pneumatization. We've lost a lot of bone there. However, this bowl shape from both dimensions, three-dimensionally now, buccal lingual and mesiodistal, it has a nice bowl shape. And that bowl shape lends itself um, to a really great surgical outcome. Now, some of you might say, gosh, that much bone loss, I really want to do a lateral approach. And you certainly could. And I would 100% agree that that could be done. What's been fun for me and um, compelling for my patients is I can go in with a more minimal invasive technique and I can still augment things like this through a crestal approach, gaining still seven, eight, nine, ten 10 millimeters of bone, which is really, really awesome. Um, without needing to go in, reflect a big flap, um, and introduce some of the complications that can arise in the lateral approach, not to mention just the technique sensitivity of that approach. However, they don't all look like this. So I wanted to share a couple of different anatomical variants that we see in the sinus. So we have the large bowl is what I would categorize this. Sometimes we have this flat type surface, maybe a little bump in the road, but I'm going to call that more flat. And I'm going to highlight that with a yellow line saying it's more, um, you know, not as ideal for a sinus lift. This is more ideal, the bull shape. A flat line like this, a little bit more difficult to lift. And then sometimes you have these very steep angles like this, which are probably the most difficult trying to go up through the sinus through a piece of bone that is so tilted like that. And so these different types of anatomy are what we're gonna be dealing with as we sinus lift. And I've done all of these with this system I'm gonna be explaining today, and I've had great results on all of them. Um, however, my favorite is that left side because you can get some really great results out of your lift. So let's jump right into it. This is the tool that I use. Um, this is the DO Navi Flapless Crestal Sinus Kit. This um, is a fantastic kit. It's pretty simple when you really dissect the parts and pieces within it. So in the top left are stoppers that go on a 2.0 drill, so your pilot drill. On the top right are stoppers that go on all of your larger drills. So there's two sets of stoppers, the very skinny type for a 2.0, and then your wider type for all of the subsequent drills and components. Down below, <clears throat> there's a sinus drill. There's three of these. They go right here. There's the membrane lifter. I often call, call this the nozzle. There's a handle that holds the membrane lifter. And then you have a bone packer and the bone packer can receive these different drill stops as to help prevent the bone packer from going too deep into the sinus after you've already created access. Last thing you wanna do is do the hard part and then shove that bone packer too deep and perforate the membrane. So that's the sinus kit. <clears throat> this kit is special, but it has to work in tandem with the Dio Navi Master Kit. And so if you show up to surgery and you just have the sinus kit, you're gonna be disappointed because that works in tandem with the Master Kit. And that's why the Master Kit is called the Master Kit. It is used with a lot of the other kits in conjunction with them. Um, and so it's a very important to understand that both of these kits are needed to do a Dio Navi protocol. Basically, those depth stops will sit 
on the um, master kit drills, allowing you to drill into the sinus, just barely creating access in a very safe manner. So these two kits are used in tandem with one another. This is the protocol. If you're familiar with DO already, they have these surgical protocols that tell you every drill, every diameter in a very clear cut, obviously linear type um, demonstration right here. What you're gonna see is different here is the use of these depth stops. So in yellow, there's a four, a four, a four. No depth stop is used here on this particular protocol. This changes all the time based on the height of bone and soft tissue. But this is the protocol that we follow. And I wanna break it down basically into three or four parts because there's a lot to digest when you just look at this. But the magic is we can take digital files, a DICOM and an STL, normally used for guided surgery. And we are now gonna do guided sinus surgery it's very, very clever how they do it. And I wanna break down kind of the components of drilling. The first criteria is approaching the sinus wall. Now that is done, like I said, with these depth stops in mind. Measurements were done in the virtual planning world so that it knows exactly what your depth is to reach the very floor of the sinus before we bump right into it. And so step one is this approach step. These depth stops obviously are pre-planned Make sure you grab the right number. The only time I've perforated the membrane with this system is when I accidentally grabbed the wrong number on the depth stop and I drilled too deep into the sinus. That was my very first uh, time doing one. Since then, it's actually gone really, really well. Haven't had any complications. So approaching the sinus wall, this is done again, low RPM, irrigation in between drills, normal DO protocols with the depth stops in place. After we approach the sinus wall and get within a millimeter or two, then we switch from a cutting drill to what I call a pushing drill. And these are the, what we call the sinus drills found within the sinus kit. These are done at extremely slow speed, 10 RPMs ideally. What you might find is your motor doesn't go down to 10 RPMs. Mine only goes down to 15. I've seen some that only go down to 20. You're gonna put it down in a very slow speed. 10 would be ideal, um, that would be their manufacturer recommendation. But I, if you can get down to at least 15, 20, I find good success with them still. And what this does, this will actually create that patency between the alveolar process and the maxillary sinus. And it does it in two steps. Step one is it pushes right to the floor. Step two, it goes all the way into the sinus creating that opening. So sometimes these are used in conjunction with depth um, drill stops from the sinus kit. Here you see the drill is just put into the guide and it's completely 100% guided straight to the very bottom of the floor of the sinus. This particular protocol I showed you does not require depth stops there, but some might um, require them again based on the anatomy. After you've created this patency or this opening into the maxillary sinus, we now move um, to the lifting process of the membrane. And in this case, it's done hydrostatically. And so hydrostatic pressure is used to lift the membrane off the walls of the sinus, lifting it up out of our way so that we can pack bone, creating that new vertical space for our implant. And so as you see here in these different pictures, you'll push the water and it teases up the membrane, lifting it up out of our way. After the membrane is lifted up, out of our way, then we go in with our bone and we'll pack our bone in there, filling the space that we lifted with the actual um, hydrostatic lift. So it's pretty straightforward when you look at these different parts and pieces. We're gonna approach the sinus wall. We're then gonna create an opening into the sinus. We're gonna then lift the Schneiderian membrane of the sinus cavity up out of our way, creating room so that bone can be packed in. Here's my biggest tip for their workflow. And this is the only thing that's kind of different for me in terms of a little clinical workaround is we need to take the bone and push it all the way through our osteotomy up into the sinus every time we add bone. Otherwise, what happens is we backlog it. What I found is when I first start pushing bone, I would push it maybe half the way up 
being a little bit hesitant to push all the way up into the sinus. And I realized as I did that, because this opening is only 3.2 millimeters wide, which is a little bit more narrow than I normally would open up to before I lift the sinus, I find that the bone sometimes can clog in that osteotomy. And I've done this case with maybe four or five doctors, first time doing it, and they've all had the same issue where they start packing the bone and then it clogs. And the workaround is pack the bone all the way up into the sinus, pushing it up over the ledge into the sinus. If you just pack it into the osteotomy because it's only 3.2 millimeters wide, I do find that it clogs a little bit and then the pressure is a little bit tricky for you. And so make sure when you push bone in, it's a full push all the way up into the sinus. And again, depth stops are put onto your bone packer and that depth stop will ensure that you cannot push the packer too deep, possibly hurting the membrane. Um, however, we're often timid to do that, but it's completely safe with the protocol they have here. So that's the protocol. I want to get into the digital aspect and planning of this because I think that's where this is really, really compelling. So how would I do a lift like this before I was doing something digitally guided? I would have to just measure on a CT the bone height and then drill until I felt like I was right there and then do a summer's up fracture up into the sinus. Now that was always exciting because I didn't really know where the apical end of my drill was relative to the floor of the sinus. And the key with an up fracture is that you're very, very close to perforating into the sinus. So that up fracture is nice and easy. In the digital world, we can simply measure tissue height to the bone, meaning tissue height is this line down here. We can measure this to the floor of the sinus. And then we know where the top of our sleeve is right here. And from there, we have exact measurements of how to use the guide to help us drill right to the sinus. So everything in this workflow, as far as engaging the floor of the sinus is all done through the surgical guide. I'm gonna skip back now to a couple of slides and I wanna just highlight this one more time. So this whole workflow, every step, except when we're using the water, and actually packing the bone is all done with the surgical guide in place. And so there's no ambiguity as to where am I drilling relative to the floor of the sinus. That has all been predetermined in virtual planning software, eliminating what I would call the most variable aspect of this procedure, which is knowing when you're right at the floor of the sinus and engaging it in a very gentle, soft fashion, even 10 RPMs with these sinus drills. And so it's pretty thoughtful. They're taking the technology, they're leveraging it in a way um, just to decrease the potential risk of perforating the sinus by falling into it prematurely or approaching it too abruptly, um, which I have certainly been guilty of in other freehand applications. And so that's really, really thoughtful. Let me jump back to some of these pictures. So in the computer simulation, these measurements are done. They're determining the thickness of tissue and bone they're then taking the drills, determining what size stopper should be used to get you to drill right to the bottom of the sinus. So here's a couple examples from my own practice of cases that were planned. Put into place, you see here's two implants simultaneously next to each other and a lot of measurements going on. This here represents the top of the surgical guide sleeve. And so the drill is gonna stop right here and they're gonna determine the length of here to the bone. And they've determined on this line that that is 12.5 millimeters. So they need to get your drill 12 millimeters. So they'll take a drill, let's say it's an 18 drill, they'll put a four stopper on it or a five stopper or a six stopper on it to get it to engage right to the bottom of the sinus. And then once it's at the bottom of the sinus, you'll use the sinus pusher to slowly go and push that last little fraction, that little sliver of bone that lets you jump now into the actual sinus cavity. Here you're seeing it from a buccal lingual view, different case with an implant placed. All these different measurements being taken from the top of the surgical guide sleeve to where the bone topography is, again, allowing us to be exactly precise drilling to the floor of the sinus. So how thoughtful is it that we can now determine this on a computer screen 
3D print a surgical stent that not just allows us to put the implant in at the right position, but also allows us to engage the sinus floor at exactly the right position. It's, uh, it's getting easier and easier for us, which is awesome. Another case, you're seeing again all the measurements being taken. Um, this is a little bit trickier one because you see the nice slope here of that posterior. That's a tricky one there. This one is also sloped here in the very mesial aspect. I'm able to do cases at an angle and then cases here um, at an angle with high, high success rate. Um, I've actually yet to perf with this system um, other than the first time when I used the wrong drill um, stop and drilled way too deep. On some of these angle ones, what you'll find is you will probably go in with their recommended length and then you might downsize the stopper a couple of sizes, allowing you to drill even deeper. So you're hitting this most superior aspect and the most inferior aspect in a stepwise approach. Because you will find if you're through the bone here, you're still two millimeters from the bone on the distal. And so you will sometimes need to stepwise your approach up into that. Let me show you a couple of cases that I did. So here's a case, um, implant placed already in the uh, anterior there and then doing a sinus lift for this number three. And um, you see the implant in place, drilling the osteotomy, packing the bone, putting in the implant, start to finish on a procedure like this, 15, 20 minutes, because um, it's all guided. And the most tedious part is actually packing the bone. That's the part that probably is the bulk of my time to actually do this procedure. Um, Here's a little pearl for you clinically. If you notice the bone here is really, really radio opaque. I'm a big fan of a synthetic beta tricalcium phosphate. Um, brand name, I use um, Sarasorb M. Um, it's a great synthetic bone, um, very radio opaque. When I am packing that bone, I can take a PA like you see here and I will see a dense mushroom type cloud above my surgical area. That's when I know my pack is nice and tight and full. It's also a good indication that there is no perforation in the membrane. Otherwise, the bone becomes much, much more loosely packed. And so this is a great case. Here's a picture of it on the CT. We obviously lifted the uh, membrane probably a little higher than we needed. I probably could have put a bigger implant in. Um, I believe that's a 5 by 11, 5 or 5 by 10 there. We could have gone a little longer. Notice though the nice bowl shape anatomy and how that bowl shape anatomy allowed me to lift the membrane very, very high. What it does is that it helps keep the bone collected together, compact without letting it wander because it literally has these boundaries that it's staying in between. When something is very steep, it likes to fall off of that slope. If it's very flat, it kind of just wanders a little bit and so when I see a bull shape anatomy, getting results like this in a crestal approach are actually predictable. I used to hear and think and was told from people, oh, four or five millimeters is the absolute max. Maybe even two or three is all you get with the crestal approach. Well, this was a crestal approach and this is about nine millimeter lift. Um, and that's really, really impressive for a technique. Not impressive for me, I'm saying not my skill that did it. It was, it was a workflow that allowed me to do that any one of us could do that with the right tools in our hand. So that's a great um, example right there. Here's another one. Um, this was a cool case where we were actually doing a full arch rehab on the upper and the back implants all were going in with sinus lifts. There's gonna be two on the right, two on the left, um, really unique anatomy in order to get this. You see a couple of little bumps in the road here, some bumps in the road here. And so this kind of was a unique case this is how it was planned up, three implants in the anterior region where the patient was already dentate, and then two implants bilaterally um, in the edentulous areas, all four of those posterior implants requiring sinus lifts, little crestal lifts. Normally, without this clever workflow for me, I would go in and do a lateral window, but I've become a really big fan of this surgical um, technique to the point that I chose just to do a crestal approach here. And so this is what the anatomy looks like. You can see a little slope here. This has a pretty aggressive slope, plus halfway into an extraction site. I mean, that's very tricky to do freehand with the crestal approach. Um, 
decent topography here, a little bit of a slope there, and um, we're able to get all four sinus lifts done um, and no perforation. Um, everything worked out just great on that. Let me show you one last case. So you saw these a little bit earlier, but I have a few more pictures I want to highlight here. So here you're seeing two implants being placed simultaneous. We have kind of a bull shape anatomy, a little bit more for the anterior. The posterior implant is kind of on the top of the bull. And so I do worry about bone leaking over this edge just a little bit. Um, but you see, again, it's all thoughtfully planned. Measurements done. It knows the bone height. It knows the drill length. And then from there, through simple math, it's going to pick out what drill, what depth stop to get you at the final position. Here's what my surgical tray setup looks like for a case like this. Um, you're seeing, let me go through a little bit of what you're seeing here. Um, you're seeing some Pyridex that my surgical guide was soaked in for about 20, 30 minutes before the surgery. You're seeing my sinus kit, my master kit. And again, these work in tandem with each other. You're seeing my sterile tubing for the hydraulic lift. You're seeing the hydraulic nozzle right there, a brand new one. I use a brand new one every surgery. You're just seeing my instrument set up over here. Two dishes with sterile saline. I often like to use PRF. So you're seeing my PRF box on the top left. Some different bone packers right here. This is my bone. Again, that Sarasorb M, that's always what I graft with in the sinus. I do sticky bone. So in the process of creating our PRF membranes, I will first draw out some of the plasma before it's coagulated, and I will inject it into my bone graft, creating a sticky bone. Um, I typically prepare one cc um, for a sinus lift, and I will graft anywhere from 0.5 to one cc per sinus lift. Sometimes, you know, that varies obviously with how much you're trying to lift, what's the anatomy, um, but 0.5 is where I tell doctors, that's probably the minimum. If you're gonna go in the sinus, you should be able to get 0.5 in there almost every time. And so 0.5 is always where I wanna go. So if that's a one cc, I wanna expect half of that gone um, before I'm even considering putting the implant in. That's my personal um, philosophy. Up at the top, you see a set of sinus curettes these are out just in case there is a perforation. If we perforate the sinus through a crestal approach, I'll need to go and repair it through a lateral approach. I don't always have it actually out on the table. Sometimes it's on the side table still wrapped up. But for this particular case, apparently it was already on the table. My staff probably thought I was for sure going to perf that day. And so they put the kit out and jinxed me, but I didn't this day. So, you know, I was right apparently that day. Um, but that's what my surgical setup looks like. Some people always ask, you know, what's on the table for this? That's what a typical sinus procedure would look like for me. Here's a little different angle of my surgical table. You're seeing just the corner of it right here, patient ready, my assistant. And I like to highlight right here, I have a little whiteboard right here where I can write different notes in preparation for surgery just to remind me as I'm in there or if we need to write anything down intraoperatively. Um, and this particular case, um, I just wanted to highlight that my surgical protocols are up on the wall and I follow those. You see a number 14 right here, number 14, number 15. They have slightly different protocols because the bone height is slightly different. And because of those slight differences, um, we're going to use different stoppers. We're going to be drilling to different depths. And so it's important to keep that organized. That's where I keep it. So I just look over my left shoulder, confirm, and then go back to my surgical site. Um, really, really nice workflow for me. It works really well in my practice. So then I follow the protocol. I approach the sinus. I engage into the sinus floor. I hydrostatically lift up into the sinus, elevating the membrane out of my way. With the membrane out of the way, I then will pack my bone in. I want to show you, um, again, the ergonomics of this. This is the part right here that people are probably most curious about. And so I put a couple of pictures and videos in about this. Here, what you're seeing, again, is the instrument to hydrostatically lift the sinus membrane. And so the surgical guide has been used with the drills to engage the floor of the sinus. In my mind, that's more the hard part but this has a little bit more technique sensitivity where the surgical guide is a little bit more load up the drill, push it properly into the guide. 
I would say it's less technique sensitive than this. And so I've loaded up the syringe with sterile saline. I've bled it so it's already coming out the end. There's not air in here anywhere. Water is all the way through the tubing. And then my job is to seat this using the handle with enough pressure to create a watertight seal. That way, as I push this pressure, the water isn't going to leak out the sides. It's actually going to go up into the sinus. That's really important. And probably the most common mistake I find, everyone does everything right, but they aren't holding the nozzle or the membrane lifter, as they call it, the green part there, at the right tension, the right angle, and as they're pushing, all the water is just leaking out the side because they don't have a good seal. And so it's a combination of having the right amount of pressure, but not too much pressure. If you push too much, I find it just kind of pushes it off to a weak point and it spills out the side. And so um, this is really, really important. I load up always two cc's. You can see I'm at the two cc line. And I'm going to push one cc. And the reason I like it at the two is if I did start to leak a bunch of irrigation out the side, and I only, if I only had one cc in there to begin with, then I have to load it back up again. And so I have one cc extra inside there in case we don't have a good seal for some part of the push. And so I like two cc's loaded up. Here's a little video I'm going to play. It has some sound with it. Here's the one thing I want to highlight, and then I'll let the video kind of speak for itself. I'm right-handed, so I like the syringe in my right hand, and my left hand is where I hold the membrane lifter. And the membrane lifter, um, after I seat it and I feel like it's in the right spot, I tell my assistant, please keep your eyes in the mouth and tell me if water is leaking, because I'm going to keep my eyes on the syringe. That's how I like to do it. Some people like the exact opposite. They like to push the syringe blind and look in the mouth. I like to leave the mouth blind and look in the syringe because all I'm looking at in the mouth is just to see if water is leaking. And my assistant is more than capable of figuring that one out. I think pushing of the um, water, the sterile saline, I think that is more important in my opinion. So I keep my eye on that. And so in this procedure, I'm going to be looking right here. I'm going to go ahead and play the video. And this is just kind of a live demonstration how I, how I lift. A good so I ensure that I have good a good seat here of the green nozzle. Now my eyes are focused right here on the syringe. I'm going to push a little bit. There's maybe one tenth of a cc. I double checked it. No water is being lost. I'm going to keep playing this game. Notice the back pressure as I release. So the push really I'm going to go for a full cc, so I'm about 60% of the way there, 70%, 80%, there's 90, still a little back pressure, which is good. That's about a cc. Now if I pull this out, going back on the front looking at the tubing right there, do you see the blood? See the blood right there? That's a good sign. Now we'll go ahead and do a little nose test. Try to breathe through your nose again. Oh, go ahead and open. Open real big. Breathe through your nose. Good. No air bubbles coming through. So that's the demonstration with that. The reason I pull back on it a little bit at the end, it should just suck that um, water right back out. And then it will mix with some blood. And you'll see that if you suck back out and you're getting air, there's no blood that's going to be in the fluid. That means you probably perforated. And again, that back pressure is important too, because we're lifting the membrane. There should be pressure there. If there was a perforation in the membrane, then that water would just push right through the respiratory system, go up through the nose probably, cause the patient to cough a little bit. Um, so I love to feel the back pressure. That's really, really important. I love to push slow. So one cc total is typically my push amount, um, sometimes a little less, um, but one cc is typically the number, and I go one-tenth at a time, believe it or not. So I push, wait for two, three seconds, push, 
and it's 10 pushes, one tenth of a CC every push is my kind of target. Um, and then you saw at the end there, I will plug the patient's nose. I have these sterile towels already over the patient. So with my sterile gloves, I can grab a sterile towel, plug the nose, have them lightly breathe through their nose called a Valsalva test or Valsalva maneuver. And I'm looking for any air bubbles because if I perforated that membrane and they're putting air pressure, that air was actually going to come out of the sinus and that water that's in there will create all these bubbles. And I'm not talking like one little bubble. You might have that as the water pushes out. I'm talking several bubbles or you just see the air kind of flying out, pushing the water out. Um, you'll, you'll know when it's perforated. And if that happens, you need to repair that. I am not personally a believer that you can repair a crestal lift thoughtfully or well through a crestal approach. I need to go in through a lateral window and repair the sinus um, and then continue with the graft. That's a whole nother lecture for another day. So that's the technique right there. Um, this was two lifts right next to each other. So I did one and then I did the other one. The only tricky part with that is you have to plug the other side um, really thoughtfully. And so we just plugged it with another membrane pusher because I had another one in the office. Um, and then I had two sinus lifts. Here you see the front one. Here you see the back one. And so this is about almost one cc right here. And this is about mm, somewhere between a half and three quarters right here. Um, but I love, that's on a PA. I mean, I love that a PA can show me where the bone is like that. That's, that's really, really nice. If you're using some other type of bone, sometimes they don't show up as well. And it leaves you scratching your head wondering, how did my lift go? Um, the other thing I'll say about the bone that I use, what I like about it, I don't find that it has a lot of sharp edges. As it um, integrates with blood, it really turns into almost like a bone mush, which I love because it doesn't have all these sharp edges that sometimes I see on cadaver bone. And I personally get a little concerned when I'm looking with my loops and I see these large pieces of um, bone and they look like almost arrowheads. They're very, very sharp. They're very, very pointed. And I can't imagine me just shoving those up the sinus under pressure, maybe acting as a sharp edge and cutting that membrane, which is delicate. Um, and so I like um, this bone for several reasons, but it's radiopaque, doesn't have these sharp edges. Um, it handles really, really well. And so I, I have no interest in that company or their bone product, but from a clinician to a clinician, I do think it's a really good uh, product. So, um, I just took a simple x-ray, uh, this is a CT, and I just took, I couldn't get an actual screenshot, so I apologize, it's so blurry, but you're clearly seeing a massive amount of bone around this front implant. You're seeing a decent amount of bone here. My regret here is maybe I should have packed a little bit more bone. I don't think I'm as dense. You see how dense this looks compared to this? You see some of the black voids. I wish I would have packed maybe a little bit more bone up here. Um, and that's kind of my hindsight 2020. A post-op CT tells you the whole story on these cases. And so you really get to beat yourself up if you want on how the case went. I definitely have good bone around it, but this looks a little bit more uh, satisfying on the x-ray for sure. That's a predictable workflow. That's a workflow that uses technology to leverage our clinical outcome. And that is what I've tried to put my stamp on almost all of my surgical procedures is how can I use technology? How can I allow it to enhance my surgical skills? Because I'm certainly still learning like all of us are. Um, and so if the technology, if a digital workflow can get me results that are more predictable easier to come by, um, less stressful to accomplish, um, then I'm all in. And in this case, this workflow I've outlined for you today for you know 40 minutes um, has done that for me. I've been a really big fan of it. It's, it's really, really exciting to take a procedure that sometimes can be daunting, overwhelming, a little arbitrary um, because you're not really seeing what you're doing, and then use a different technique that somehow takes away um, those daunting, intimidating um, components and makes it more predictable. And so that's what it's been for me. I hope uh, this was helpful for you. I appreciate your time and attention. Um, um, and so thank you so much for tuning in. Um, appreciate, again, the effort you made to be here. I hope that you are doing well in your practices um, and uh, appreciate everything uh, 
you guys are, are doing and attending. So take care. Thank you again for, for coming in.